Kalidas Khosh. Kalidas Khosh is the chairman of FE Credit as well as the vice chairman for BP Bank, Vietnam Prosperity Bank. Kalidas Khosh is also the founder for the U Bank, which is a digital only bank of BP Bank, and also the founder of Uno Bank in Philippines. Today, FE Credit is the fastest and the largest growing consumer finance company in ASEAN. Under the leadership of Kalidas Khosh, FE Credit today has grown and served more than 12 million plus people across the countries. And as we talk about, it has $1 billion of our annual revenue. Mr. Kalidas Ghosh has 25 plus years of our industry experience and have worked with multiple banks as well as financial institutions globally. In July 2019, Kalidas Ghosh has been honored with the CEO of the Year Award by Asia Pacific Customer Service Consortium. It is a pleasure to have you, Mr. Kalidas Ghosh, on our panel today and look forward for an interesting discussion with you. Yeah, Thank thanks. You. Welcome to all of you and, and glad to be here. Just a small correction, I'm the Vice Chairman and CEO of FE Credit and not an office holder of uh, VP Bank, even though VP Bank is the parent of FE Credit. Uh, yeah. Um, I will move on to the next panelist, Mr. Samir Soleiman. So Mr. Samir Soleiman is the CEO of Arab Financial Solutions. AFS is the leading fintech service provider in the Middle East region. Prior to joining AFS, Mr. Samir Soleiman was the MD for Network International and was managing the uh, business uh, of Network International in Middle East. Throughout his career, Mr. Samir Soleiman has held various leadership positions in Network International, like he was a chairman of Network International Jordan. He was a MD of Network International Egypt. He's, all, he's also on the board of Discover Card in Middle East, as well as the, the Union Pay International. Mr. Samir Suleiman is a fintech enthusiast and is on the board of multiple fintech service providers. So currently he's on a board of Jingle Pay, which is a payment service provider or so-called the Neobank in UAE. He's also on the board of Zibuni. It's an e-commerce startup along with Swara Digital Finance. Recently, Mr. Samir Suleiman has also featured in Arab Power List 2021 along with Visionaries in Middle East. It is a pleasure to have you here, Mr. Uh, Samir Suleiman. Looking forward for an interesting discussion with you. Pleasure is mine. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. I'll move on to the next panelist, Mr. Anish Achuttal. Anish is a tech visionary and is a senior entrepreneur. He has 17 plus years of a industry experience and in his past um, stint he has co-founded multiple companies. Anish's first startup was in 2001, iFutures. In 2007, Anish started CashNext, which was a financial inclusion platform which was later acquired by a company in Latin America. In 2013, Anish co-founded ZSwitch, which was in 2015 acquired by Citrus Pay. In 2017, Anish co-founded a new bank or Open, which focuses on the SME segment. Open is Asia's first neo banking platform that automates various business processes around banking and the payments for the SMEs and the startup. Welcome, Anish, and look forward for having an um, interesting discussion with you today. Thanks, will... yeah. thanks, thanks a lot, Anish. Now I will move on to uh, Mr. Ravish Bhatnagar, so a banker. Uh, he is from uh, Indusind Bank. So Ravish has 12 plus years of uh, industry experience and currently he is the head of digital banking with Indusind Bank. Prior to joining Indusind Bank, Ravish was working with uh, McKinsey and Company for seven and a half years where he has helped multiple banks, especially the top three banks in India to set up the lending business. Ravish is a fintech enthusiast and is currently working on the digital banking strategy for Indusind Bank. Welcome Ravish on the panel. Hi, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be a part of this panel. Fantastic. So setting up a context. Um, so well, um, today, as I spoke about, we are trying to get it, uh, we are going to discuss about our digital banks. And I think today we are at an interesting crossroads where at one end of the spectrum, we are seeing a lot of tech companies starting a new bank or so-called a new banking uh, platform. And on the other side, we have the banks who are going through the interesting wave of digital transformation and are trying to be think like a tech company. Digital banking as a, uh, as a um, banks have exploded in the recent past and is continued to grow at a 46% of an annual year-on-year -year growth. 
the latest report of Accenture indicates that there have been 70 plus digital banks that have opened last year and there are um, across the uh, globe and there are central banks across Southeast Asia, Middle East and India which are inviting applications for the digital bank and also at the same point of time bringing in regulations like the open APIs so that a new banking platforms can connect and offer a superior customer experience. As part of a today's session, we would like to talk about the digital bank. What are the challenges that we are seeing on the digital banking side as well as the road ahead? So starting with Anish, because you have co-founded a digital bank in India, which is a hotbed of technology startup. We would really like to understand your experience in terms of setting up and scaling a bank from for one bank at the back end, which was ICIC Bank, to around 18 banks and having 1 million customers. Obviously, SME as a segment is exploding. There is a lot of interest from the existing banks, as well as from the tech startups like the Zazer Pace of the world, the Jupiters of the world, to get into the segment. So just wanted to understand how has been your journey and how do you see this entire digital banking platform in India evolving? Uh, yeah, so uh, Vivek, I'll start with a disclaimer, uh, you know, as rightly mentioned, we are not a bank, we work with a banking partner, so we can't call ourselves as a bank by regulation. Uh, so uh, primarily, like we started open in 2017, and uh, the reason, uh, the, the idea behind was that while in our uh, previous businesses, I used to deal with a lot of small businesses and SMEs, and one thing which we realized was that business banking is broken for them, they struggle a lot in terms of tracking cash flows, dealing with multiple interfaces. And that's when the thought came up, like, you know, if all your cash flows, money moves through your current account, and if you know that, okay, where the money is coming from and where it is going out, I can automate income expense and accounting while doing the banking transactions. So can we build, a, uh, you know, can we turn the current account into a financial OS to help a business automate their finance? For that, can we build a digital bank? Now, the regulations are like, you know, very tough, as we all know, in India, where there was a, a payment bank license, and there was also a few of the small finance bank licenses and few universal bank licenses, which we got. But uh, even for a startup like us, like even, uh, it's nearly impossible to even think about like having a banking license. So that's when we looked at some of the international models, especially in Europe and the US, uh, wherein like the, fin the fintech startups ride on the license of an existing banking partner. And we thought like that's a great model to replicate because in India, uh, even before, uh, you know, uh, banks used to partner for UPI or prepaid and that model existed. Uh, so that's how we got started. And um, on the, today, like uh, we have our, we power around um, 1 million uh, SMEs uh, uh, in the market. We process uh, 24 billion US dollars in annualized transactions. And one difference what we found in our experience was that unlike Europe and US, uh, prob where uh, you know, a small change, incremental change in customer experience would give you more customers. In India, the banks are really advanced. Like I'm happy with a HDFC or a Kotak uh, a mobile bank application. Why should somebody uh, migrate their bank banking? But when it comes to business banking, we realized that okay, this payment pay points of receivables and payables do exist. So we took that as an approach to get the customer and put banking as in the back, basically. That's how, that's the learning which we had. Uh, so yeah, so, uh, so far, like that's been our journey, like around 1 million customers. Uh, and we ended up partnering with multiple banks because uh, again, we realized and like, uh, outside markets, you don't have a single bank which could actually help you to build an entire infrastructure for a bank. For example, there could be banks which could give you an API to launch a current account, but then to issue a prepaid card or a credit card or a debit card, maybe that particular bank may not have the capability or they don't have a model for bin sponsorship. So we end up partnering with another different bank. So that's how we ended up partnering with different banks, but the end customer experience, customer doesn't probably always realize that there are these multiple banks powering your business banking service. Oh, thank, thanks a lot, Anish. So I think, um, let me move to Kali Das Ghosh. So Kali, uh, on one side, we have seen Anish who has set up or who have ride on to the existing rails of a, a bank to provide a new banking platform, given the um, regulations that we have within India. You have been instrumental in setting up the U-Bank, uh, which is the digital bank for the VP Bank. How has been your experience in setting up that bank and scaling that? And also, we would also like to talk about the UNO Bank that you have set it up in Philippines. Uh, well, with regard to U-Bank, uh, it uh, evolved from a very, I mean, as you know, FE Credit evolved from a traditional finance company to becoming a credit card or a credit line uh, sort of a business, which moved uh, uh, 
uh, one step ahead of a pure installment loan, consumer finance kind of proposition to a more wholesome credit line or uh, managing the credit relationship of the with the customer as we built history of this. And then we realized that we have opportunity for larger services to be provided to the same customer. So that's when we looked at uh, introducing banking for these customers. Many of our customers actually had a bank account before because in Vietnam, payment of salaries is mandated to bank accounts. And even now, because of uh, the expansion of digital payments, many of these even business folders uh, do have bank accounts, but they are completely underutilized. Typically, uh, the cash is taken out of them and there are literally uh, no effective use useful transactions other than cash withdrawal and then, you know, in order to fuel the cash develop a cash dependent economy. So we thought that we will introduce a digital bank which would be useful for our customers because they'd be customized for their requirements as opposed to main street banks which were uh, targeting or catering to the top echelons of the of the community of the of the population because of profitability reasons. Obviously, if you have uh, branches, if you have staff, you have you have cumbersome processes and the costs associated with them, the the uh, transactions have to be profitable enough to support those type of costs. So they were not to be done with the kind of customers that we service. So we felt that if we have a, a light footed, uh, nimble, uh, easy to operate, you know, entirely in the palm of somebody's hand through a mobile phone, if that kind of a relationship can be built through a banking uh, business, uh, we should be able to service our customers. That was the principal philosophy behind Ubank and it's uh, working out quite well. Uh, of course, our view is a little different from what we just heard from Anish around open, because from our perspective, uh, we still pay paramount importance to managing the balance sheet, because that's what is in our books. And therefore, all the paraphernalia of managing a balance sheet has to be catered to by us. So yes, technology is very important, because that's what runs the business, acquires customers, manages them, uh, retains them, upgrades them, etc. But at the same time, the back end has to be, and especially the balance sheet has to be managed as well. Uh, you, uh, Uno in Philippines is a little different in the sense that it is being built from scratch, but with similar experience. It is also a credit led digital banking proposition. So in a way, maybe five years hence, Uno and New Bank would have very similar uh, look and feel, very similar complexion, uh, but the development history is a little different for each one of them. Understood, understood. I think th thanks a lot. So coming to Samir, uh, so we have on one side, we have seen Anish who has launched a bank, uh, or I would say open using the existing APIs, the so-called the open APIs from the, the existing banks and offering various type of uh, SME services. On the other side, we have Kali who has actually done the entire bottom up um, full stack bank to offer the services of banking services to the banks in Vietnam and hopefully uh, expanding it on Philippines side. So you being on a board of Zingle, you being um, uh, running a successful uh, wallet program in Bahrain, how do you see the digital banking evolving in Middle East? I think uh, the, 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 there, is a, there is a big move accelerated by the COVID pandemic uh, towards digital experience. And, and this is across multiple industries. However, I think where the timing of when an investment is done is quite critical. So early on, AFS decided to invest on a digital uh, wallet, a mobile uh, wallet in partnership with a local MNO in this market. And basically what we did is that uh, the objective of this proposition was to address the segments that are seeking lifestyle, improved lifestyle, and actually tackling untapped segments like um, uh, blue collars in the market. So what we did is that we, we created two different differentiated products. One is to address um, an added value to the existing customer base of the community and give them a differentiating value. Uh, for example, uh, benefits and rewards versus a traditional credit card. And the second one was actually to tackle an untapped segment. Um, uh, we have uh, done uh, a great success story during the uh, implementation, during the launch, where we have uh, reached to more than 100,000 cards uh, across this market. And we expanded even our geography from one market to three markets today. And we are looking at further markets. Um, the key uh, challenge that I, I really look at uh, from a business perspective is that this business is very dynamic. And traditional banking uh, is very, very slow compared to the 
technology of today. So if you compare where, and this is my personal assessment, where, where the technology of the banking industry, I think it's here, and where is the global technology, it went up there. To bridge this gap, digital banks are gonna play a critical role, but the digital bank is only one component of it that requires a significant investment and in infrastructure that drives this. Also, as part of the group, we've got an organization, for example, and this is something that I, I really uh, am, 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 am impressed with, and I have to mention it. Uh, there is a local bank that's owned by the group, which is called Ila Bank, and we support Ila Bank in their debit cards and in their uh, proposition. However, they have developed a slick onboarding capability that I was amazed when, when I went through the onboarding process, a full process within less than a minute I am on board and I actually topped up my account while I was in bed. Uh, I was testing it, you know, I, I like FinTech, so I like to see how things operate and the onboarding experience is unbeatable and it's compliant with every single requirement of a very, uh, very, very uh, strong regulator in this market. So um, it requires a lot of investment, it requires a lot of passion and it requires you to be up to speed with what's happening in the industry and the customer needs to make sure that you develop your technology as you go. And this is why I, why Agile is quite important. Uh, this is why uh, it is very important as an organization to understand your customer needs and make sure that every experience you give him is one step less. It might not uh, have an impact in India short term, but I think Anish, uh, I think long term it will have a significant impact. And as you develop your product going forward, this will be a key differentiator. And once competitors lands, more value proposition comes out to customers. And again, it helps uh, a lot in the digital transformation of cash. Remember, cash is still significant in the region where we operate in, across Middle East and Africa. And uh, that is a very, very uh, um, important component to convert cash to digital as well. So, so a lot of happening on that domain here. And I'm looking at even expanding this further to providing digital transformation of banks as a service to the, to the client. So a lot of happening on that domain, but um, happy to hear more and learn more from uh, the panelists here. Thanks, thanks, Samir. I think you brought a very important point and now coming to Ra Ravish. I think Samir talked about a very important point in terms of the technology which a traditional bank is using vis-a-vis -vis what a digital bank is using. And he used a very important example, which is perhaps one of the first touch point when I try to uh, uh, get into the banking relationship is in terms of an onboarding. So how, as a banker, how do you see you uh, embracing this challenge or this opportunity in terms of competing with so-called so many digital banks or the fintech startups coming in what is being your thoughts uh, being a banker over here sure so see i'll, I'll actually uh, i'll actually talk about uh, maybe my experience not just at the current bank but uh, also you know the the number of banks that i've served and also you know a couple of banks that i was a part of before your new agency See, every organization needs to chart its own path, right? That's that's my firm view. And uh, I think as a bank, uh, you know, there is space for both, right? Uh, banks will need to ensure that they are right up there competing with the fintechs because at the end of the day, uh, you know, I have to compete with the 40 plus app in a consumer's, you know, uh, mobile handset, right? So if I'm not as good as the remaining fintechs out there, I will become irrelevant in the long run, right? So that's... That's how banks will need to do it. But that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, so uh, that creating a digital bank is the only way out. I think there is scope for even partnership. Uh, and I'll give you an example, right? So a bank can actually create a digital play or a digital attacker play, compete with the, with the fintechs uh, out there in the Indian market or, you know, Asian market, as well as there you will see a lot of digital attacker play in the West, yeah, Europe and US. So, what banks can typically do is, uh, you know, uh, because they have a lot of trust from the, you know, customers and the large banks especially have. So they can, you know, try and create a digital attractive play similar to the N26, the Monzo, the revenues of the world. Be right up there by, uh, you know, focusing both on the front end innovation and the back end innovation. At least uh, to Samir's point, uh, Indian market, at least I will believe and I know that it's slightly different. Uh, where we do a lot of front-end innovation, right? And openness 
for example you know one of the one of the good stories that have come out right so in indian fintech and banking industry the innovations have kept on happening on the front end side right i think it's a back end uh, back end uh, where we need to match up with maybe you know uh, the fintechs exactly right and have the right back end so digital attacker play for a bank is is actually critical and it will obviously requ- require a lot of commitment from the bank across you know uh, having the right value proposition finalizing the right segment choosing the right set of products features channels partnerships uh you know brand uh, technology data analytics there are there are just like tons of levers right that the bank has to think of uh, but once you have chosen the right segment once you have chosen the the right set of uh, you know value story for uh, and the right set of uh, you know feature stack right that you want to deliver to the customer you can try and see that you know uh, is there a, a new bank out in the market which is maybe offering a different sort of a value proposition which is let's say complementary to yours which is maybe targeting a different segment and over there you can you can provide uh, the entire set of your you know apis your core apis and power the new banking journeys as well so it's it's not a either or or i think it's both uh, you need to find your right uh, you know your play first i think that's important and in parallel try and identify the right neo banks which can complement uh at least your digital attacker play i think that's somewhere what i have uh, at least i have seen in my experience and you know this is what i can tell you from my personal vantage point thanks thanks a lot savish i think you made very important point in terms of looking at a two prong strategy obviously first from the front end perspective as well as from the back end perspective and kali this brings me to you uh, i know that fe credit is one of the most talked about case study in southeast asia in terms of how you have gone about the digital transformation and reducing the onboarding taking the specific case of a onboarding for a customer from a digit traditional lending platform which used to take 4 to 5 days to now it takes less than 10 to 15 minutes so how did you go about that entire transformation i'm sure as ravish was talking about it the transformation starts from the back end and then goes to the front end so how did you go about that doing this entire transformation especially when we look at the fe credit as a business line yeah our ex- experience was actually a little different so we had been starting to look at and and keep a watch on the industry trends and also on consumer behavior in vietnam vietnam as you know is one of the markets where uh, digital adoption is of a very high nature uh, the level of internet mobile penetration uh, it has 160 million connections for a country with 100 million people so you know the joke is that people in vietnam are born with mobile phones right so, uh, so it, uh, otherwise the number couldn't have been that that high and and also the number of times or hours they spend on mobile phone and other uh, devices it became very apparent that it has to feature our whole inter- interface with the customer which was very intermediary driven direct sales agents te- uh, tele sales agents dealers that has to go completely different in future and when we started this journey we realized that we have to do it in three baskets and that that is a strategy which in fact we worked with one of the large global consultants that uh, that uh, ravish mentioned is uh, some somebody uh, and and it, it, people who really helped us to formulate that strategy where we looked at it three different baskets so the first one was the way we we interacted with a customer so we started looking at how to deliver the loan within let's say 10 minutes to a new customer people somebody whose record we do not have with us already uh, or even new to credit customer uh, by obtaining information in a very easy convenient way from the customer right up front uh, and then but we and, and then underwrite on board him without making any compromise to the underwriting standards just like samir was talking about uh, compliance standards we had our underwriting standards to live up to because un- if we are to compromise over there the credit quality of the portfolio will suffer Uh, irreparably so we had to make sure that those those aspects are maintained but while we were doing that while we were changing the front end customer interface you know going through mobile phones websites even chat mode now through a uh, you know through this chat uh, uh, medium uh, by i- interfacing with a bot and then transferring to an agent only when required we realized that unless the back end changes we will not be able to do so there we made a important decision we used to have these verticalized systems for Uh, lead management loan origination customer service collection we threw all of that out and we bought a bpm solution and we configured the entire customer journey on a horizontal system 
so that it can interface through APIs with the front-end system and realize the goal of a unified customer journey. So now, today, if we have to change in that journey, let's say uh, we have to introduce an e-commerce-led journey for a customer, uh, the time taken and the flexibility is much higher because we have changed the back-end as well. And the final, uh, so there, and then we started imp implementing robotic automation in some processes. We started taking a, uh, services like face recognition, conversational AI, and it became easy for us because now there was one customer journey and we could avail these services through API at any point of time along that journey. Not only change the journey, but also design that journey at will. Uh, so that was the second basket, which was basically the backend processes, RPA, single uh, platform customer journey, uh, customer journey, single platform customer journey, and things like that. And then the third basket was around data. So we realized that now we have significantly more data. Earlier, we just had an application form from the direct sales agent, but now we have you know, his entire data uh, that is residing on his device that he has created on platform like you know, social media or uh, e-commerce uh, e uh, portals. So now we were able to access that data and that in turn reinforced our onboarding process, both on sales and marketing side, propensity and timing and contextual marketing and things like that, but also on the credit side, because now we had enhanced data for doing the underwriting. So if you look at it, uh, we had all these three work streams strung together in a manner that they came together uh, uh, all together to create this perfect storm of sorts, where we could change the customer interface that made us more accessible to our customers, presented our products and services in a more convenient, flexible manner, and helped him to access those fund, uh, those services and products. Uh, we changed the backend and we changed uh, the way we look at customer data. Uh, instead of just asking for the data we require, we actually started acquiring all the data that we could and then started making some meaning out of it. So uh, I think that was uh, uh, that's how it was, uh, you know, reasonably well coordinated by a very strong team of management professionals. We had also acquired. We brought in new talent. I mean, at the end of it. We couldn't have done unless our people, our team, and some of them are specifically recruited for this purpose. Our partners, like our global, uh, the strategy consultants and our IT partners, uh, that were that helped us to to deliver this. Understood. I think uh, uh, that's important in terms of um, looking at this entire digital transformation from all the three buckets. Kali, as you just spoke about, to some extent. If I have to talk about the uh, Ella Bank that your parent company, ABC, or the holding company launched, so would like to understand from your perspective, when ABC launched Ella, Ella Bank, and perhaps one of the most successful digital banks in Bahrain, what was their thought process? Uh, were they, again, looking at bringing in the all together the new systems and creating the bank uh, complete bottom-up? Or they the way Kali described, they looked at the various customer journey, looked at the existing tech, and then tried to uh, essentially digitize the various journeys. And wherever required, bringing the new tech, like the BPM that Kali spoke about. Um, absolutely. So I think what is imminent at this point of time that uh, digital is reality. It's not a luxury that you have to have, right? So if you are a bank and you are not investing in digital transformation, so you are not, you are not, uh, uh, you, you're going to miss on something for sure. Um, because customers will tend to move towards digital and convenience going forward. I think um, as an early adopter of innovation, ABC has been always uh, uh, an early adopter of innovation. They invested early on a digital retail banking. They don't have any digital branches, it's all digital retail banking capability. So it's part of the strategy of uh, digitizing the bank and they started with the retail uh, component of it. Actually, the leadership of the bank then took over the strategy and took it into execution. And the beauty of that uh, organization in my point of view is that they keep on releasing functionalities and capabilities as, as they go. They gamified the experience. Uh, uh, it, it is quite interesting to see, um, despite uh, Bahrain um, is, is, is a market, it's actually a place where you proof test all your capabilities. Uh, regulators are very uh, toned on. Um, technology is pretty invested in. Resources are really capable and, and well um, hungry to understand and learn more and develop more. 
and it's 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 a it's a raw market. So if you think about Ila Bank and their market share in two years, I think they have achieved whatever traditional bank couldn't achieve in ten years. And with the roadmap that I'm not uh, even close to, I think uh, it's bound to be much much larger as an organization. But any bank that have got the capability today and is not thinking about digitizing it, starting with the retail, and I think Anish, uh, to your point, SME is, is another area that needs to be serviced. I think that's why most of the banks will, will get into into that now. The, the the bigger, I think, the bigger deal going forward is the open banking or open finance, right? Because remember, you, you create a customer uh, experience. You, you you have a UX for your, your user experience out of this uh, out of a digital bank, and then you enrich it with data and capabilities like Kalidas was mentioning. You're reaching out to uh, social media to get more information. What about sharing actually the data that's available with all the other banks and building credit decisioning and growing your business from that? I think open banking um, APIs or open finance, because now they added the insurance component to it, uh, it, it is going to drive even further growth to the digital banking and empower the digital banks with much more capabilities as, as we go. Um, and, and I'll leave, I want to leave it here. Thank, thanks, Samir. So, come, Anish, coming to you, I think uh, essentially, um, obviously looking at India as a country, over there, it's all about open APIs. And open is also using the APIs from the multiple banks. Today, as we speak about, you have 18 banks at your back end through which you can offer the current accounts to the existing SMEs. So what do you think? Uh, obviously, the back end in this case is pretty much the APIs are pretty much the same, which any other, uh, I would say, uh, any other platform can get it. So what do you think would differentiate one um, open from the other competitors? And what do you think uh, the winner would be doing differently over a period of time to get more and more SMEs hooked onto the platform? Got it. So uh, Vic, I'll talk, uh, at least from our experience, both from a bank's perspective and as well as Open's perspective. Uh, so not all the backend APIs are the same, like some of the uh, legacy core banking systems, when they expose, uh, they may not have the capabilities in some cases uh, to expose this to the fintechs, or many times like it's not uh, intuitive enough or flexible enough for to support your business models. So uh, there are banks which have actually taken this as a serious initiative where they had actually separately set up a business unit. They started working on the APIs, basically. Uh, they probably have actually started building a middleware on top of that things, and they started putting up the good APIs. And then there are the banks which are still the old fashioned way as well. Now, uh, if you look at uh, in the international markets uh, uh, where uh, the new banks which doesn't have a license when they partner they always go with the smaller banks basically if you look at the us it will be always an evolved trust it's because probably you also get the flexibility to uh, put your infrastructure uh, on the bank basically whether you had seen this in case of acquiring where you take an acquiring bin or in terms of issuance you take an issuing bin but you build the infrastructure on that thing now in india also we had tried that model so in some some of the services we consume the existing uh, APIs from the banks. And that's where like the quality actually of these APIs varies. The success rates varies basically from bank to bank, uh, bank to bank and infrastructure to infrastructure. For example, uh, even the most commonly used service for like UPI, where, where not only open, maybe like a, a payment provider, basically, they always shift between two, three different banks because of the you know difference, right? So uh, what we are also, what we believe is that the one FinTech, which would be able to uh, you know, create a moat would be to work closely with the bank, most probably would be like a smaller banks, because India has got a lot of small finance banks, as well as more nimble banks, where they're able to control that experience, can they actually build that middleware, of course, within the uh, regulations, basically, and uh, it's also this nimble is not about technology as well, right? Because it's also more about like the departments and the bureaucracy as well. It's also come, is very much important when you have to do that. So uh, without taking too much time, like one when uh, last year, uh, when I was talking to one of the uh, banks in Southeast, uh, in Asia, they were saying that we set up a separate subsidiary for digital banking. We put everyone into a co-working space. We give them t-shirts basically to make uh, and separate brand. But when it comes to the legal, the same old guy in the bank is what they have to actually go back. So there's a lot of pushbacks uh, on that side uh, as well. So, uh, you know, uh, since we're talking about the backend, along with the backend, there are a lot more functionalities as well. And I do believe the fintech which will uh, win or create a mode is the one which can actually 
build a little more infrastructure on top of the backend, basically, or cases like cards and all, put your own boxes or put your own infrastructure, just only go for the main sponsorship and you control the experience part of it. And thanks a lot. Maybe before Ravish, I come to you because I have another point that I wanted to check. But Kali, specifically when you launched UBank, what are the things that you did, like Anish was talking about in terms of putting the team separately, giving them a separate t-shirts to feel as if they are a separate entity. So how did this thing uh, work out for you, especially when you set up a uh, UBank over there? Well, uh, yeah, uh, we took the same approach with almost the same uh, end uh, in terms of having to go back to the bank because obviously we are operating under the ages of the of the license of the bank. Uh, it is basically powered till the time I, we presume digital banking framework becomes more defined in Vietnam. Uh, we, however, try to uh, sort of immunize against uh, the usual bureaucracy of maybe a legacy bank by making sure that it uh, the approval process is streamlined. So for example, uh, it goes directly to the highest committee, which approves usually other than, uh, instead of going through the entire uh, uh, individual steps of reaching that point. In other words, you know, have direct access to the highest decision-making body. And we were all present in those bodies to make sure that decisions are taken in the interest of the digital bank in a manner which is compliant. So we tried to find a happy medium. Obviously, they, uh, we needed to take the bank uh, and its governance structures okay for everything that we do, because ultimately what we do can or will affect the bank's license as well, uh, the regulation, the regulatory relationship of the bank. Uh, so, so yes, we tried as best as we can at the operating and uh, uh, business model, keep it separate from the traditional, the legacy bank. But we obviously in, right now have that umbilical cord with the main bank and we have to respect in terms of compliance and regulations. Understood. So come, Ravish, coming back to you, I think at the start you talk about the important aspect of collaborating with the fintechs and Anish also spoke about the fact that today the APIs or when you, mostly when you talk about a collaborating with the fintechs, it's all about getting and uh, giving an access to the fintechs or these new platforms to your API so that they can pick up the customer data, open the, uh, do various banking services. So as a banker or as a industry bank, how do you see you are doing this digital transformation? Because obviously the success and the transactions that would drive, obviously uh, these new banking platforms over a period of time are also driving a lot of transaction. Anish was talking about having 1 million plus SMEs in past uh, two, two and a half odd years. So there's a bulk of transaction that could be coming from these new banking platforms. And obviously the banks which would have a best APIs at the back end, which are able to provide all the services would be able, would be the, uh, where the transactions would get routed to. So as a bank, how do you see you doing this digital transformation where you can start supporting more and more fintechs onto your platform while at the same point of trying, trying to launch your own digital banking as an offering? Yeah. So, so Vivek, maybe let me, uh, you know, talk about, I think, three main uh, areas, right, which uh, as a bank, as well as, you know, and, and again, right, leveraging the majority of the experience that I've had is actually consulting a lot of other banks. Uh, I think it's been a year here. But uh, the, there are three major areas, right? Uh, and this is uh, true for both uh, helping or at least powering the new banks in what you are saying, as well as having your own strategy, right? Because unless and until you have, uh, so it's, it's not about, uh, you know, so one, there are these standard APIs that will be there, right? So you'll be able to, let's say, provide an account statement on email, you'll be able to do a bunch of things around if you require, let's say, on WhatsApp or PDF uh, statement download, etc. right? So there are these bunch of APIs that will, that will be required. But unless and until you actually innovate on the APIs and try and deliver, uh, you know, something differentiated to your own customer, that API will never become a new API, right? Unless your partner, let's say the new bank says, Ki, okay, uh, you know, we want to provide a service in a very different manner, right? We, we want to have an interactive sort of a statement. So now, now you may need to go back and actually then reconfigure your APIs to a different context, right? So, uh, so at least in my view, uh, you will require to power your own digital bank's journey and the same, uh, at least the same whatever infrastructure and APIs you set up, you'll be able to leverage that better for your partners, right? So the banks will need to think of both of these things in the same manner, but but there are three areas which which they will need to think about it in a very different manner, right? And the first one is relevant for uh, uh, the digital bank, the own bank that you want to set up. 
and the remaining two are common for both the new and the digital banks so basically uh, see and, and uh, so basically the three areas are essentially what is the value story right now value story is something that uh, you will need to understand what is the value story you want to provide what is the kind of organization you want to set up right you want to have a hr inside you want to have a legal inside to you know anish's point you need to think of a lot of those things and you need to think of basically the entire brand identity that you want to create right but this these three elements right which is basically the first part which is what is your brand identity what is the organization what is your existence right this will be relevant for a, for a digital bank that you create on your own because the neo bank which comes in and partners with you they would have thought through this answer right and they wouldn't uh, want to you know they might want some suggestions etc if they are not clear on something but typically what i've seen is that these neo banks at least the neo banks are pretty clear on their value story their identity right the value proposition that, that they are bringing right so for digital bank this this becomes important right now coming to the two elements which are common right which which is the functional stack so the entire fun- functional stack the feature stack the the you know the product story right now that is where the the what you differentiate for your own brand you will be able to replicate it for the for the new uh, banking setup right if you have at the back end configured let's say you know apis which help you categorize spends right and and uh, i think uh, open is right here and you know anish should have done a lot of it say they're looking at you know the the balance sheet trying to understand you know the accounting statements and categorized it right so unless you have categorized it in your own uh, you know bank you have done it you will never understand the the nitty gritties that are involved over there right so that will always help if you have done some sort of an innovation inside the bank which can then actually power the new banking story right so that's the second major element the first is obviously the identity the second is the the functional and the product story and the third is uh basically the the technology right the technology story which can be divided into in my opinion basically five parts right uh, what is your 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 cloud and the infra story which can power both your you know digital and the new bank story what is your data uh, and you know data and the personalization strategy right because at the end of the day uh, people can replicate the product story right people can also try and let's say poach in or acquire hire an organization right uh, and people can replicate channels right but what will what will be very difficult to replicate is the is the personalization story right because you would have built your data uh, you know the entire uh, data structures accordingly right the number 3 within the technology but is the api led connectivity right that again will power your internal digital assets and will power the neo banking assets right so you can't think of it differently right and number 4 is basically your experience apis right uh, your you you want to give the what kind of experience you want to provide right so if you for example uh, you are providing a ui ux but along with that there are so many differential experience apis that you can build right can you build a orchestrator api where you deliver one journey but using the orchestrator you can deliver like 6 7 8 different forms of that journey right and the final element is actually the core technology right which is how will your core tech scale uh, as per the needs of the organization i think these are uh, all in all three elements and 10 main points within these three uh, you know areas which are important which will power your uh, you know a banks and an organizations own uh, digital banking story as well as it will power the new banking partners that will come to an organization perfect thank thanks for the service so we, we've spoken about the evolution of a digital bank we spoke about the transformations that the conventional banks are doing to go and compete with the so called uh, uh, neo banks or the neo banking platform now uh, would like to really understand how is this entire uh, uh, this entire business or the business model changing with the onboard of a uh, covid and now we are out of the woods uh, in many of these countries so how is this business is it going to change this uh, pandemic is it going to change the business model the way the banks are working today or the product services mix and also would like to understand slightly more on the profitability anish because today whenever we speak about like yesterday there was a news article which talked about the with the latest funding the new bank valuation has reached to 30 billion dollars so and still we know that the banks are losing money on each and every customer acquisition so would like to understand from you anish starting from you in terms of how this pandemic is impacting if at all in terms of the business model and the product service mix that the banks are offering and what about the profitability is it pushing the profitability further down or how is it impacting right so uh, we uh, 
post the pandemic, I mean, not the post the pandemic, uh, I mean, when uh, post COVID uh, happened last year, what we have seen is like on uh, the initial three months, we have got impacted a bit, especially a lot of our businesses, I mean, they got shut down or like some of the industries got impacted. But what we've seen is whether there was actually a like a huge transformation, the digital transformation from the businesses, whether it are like freelancers or SMEs, they realized now that, okay, now this is very important to digitalize my finances. And, you know, uh, in open, we always never positioned as a digital bank fully because you're always positioned as a financial automation suit. So, and this was something which was relevant because, you know, for them to manage, automate their finances, automate their reconciliation part of it. So we actually seen an increase by around 20 percentage uh, of the on the number of uh, accounts being opened on a monthly basis and even a month on month we had been growing now coming to uh, the you asked about the profitability part of like new banks uh, right and uh, even um, Kaldas mentioned that right uh, uh, also mentioned before that uh, you know, it's very important that, okay, when you have a banking license, you can actually control the balance sheet and it gives you more leverage, basically, whereas players like us, we don't really get that advantage fully, like, you know, uh, for example, I can't do anything with the float, which I bring to the banking partner. So uh, in case of open, we had always taken an approach of um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, targeting a segment which already pays for certain financial automation services, whether they're using QuickBooks or Zoho, basically for a subscription. So we have a subscription model. Uh, even though the service is a freemium model, we have got a subscription model where we uh, ch uh, charge a monthly premium for expense management or uh, subscriptions. Then we do have a revenue sharing component, whether it is like the you know the cards, like the interchange revenue fee, or uh, on the payment gateway we have like a you know revenue share on the few bips, basically. Then the per transaction fees. So that's how the co uh, combination and what we've seen is like the in fact we started the service was completely free till around last april and during the pandemic is what we actually uh, started the monetization and what we're actually seen from actually it went from almost 300 to 400 x uh, from zero basically in terms of the revenues and it's been month on month it's been going on a very healthy uh, level as well now it again depends on different business models basically for example on the consumer neo banking side Obviously, you can't charge the customers. You'll have to work out on the models on because mostly outside India, it's always been the interchange revenues and the float revenues. In India, there are like few challenges in terms of like, you know, regulatory challenges in terms of uh, working on a revenue share on the deposits that you bring in or like even putting that deposits back to lending as well. Obviously, you can do whole lending models and, you know, the other uh, models to lend to the customers as well. And uh, going forward, even for players like us uh, and even other neo banks, I think lending and wealth management is also going to be like one major uh, areas for because uh, uh, specifically for players like us, we have a lot of lot more access to uh, you know the payables the receivables the frequency in which they get paid and combine that with traditional underwriting that gives you more opportunity to create more intuitive uh, lending products for example a cash flow prediction model where i say that hey Vig, you have uh, from your cash flow prediction you have six months of runway but here's a credit line that is actually available on your card kind of things so that's the way in which we are seeing like you know the industry evolving at least from a india perspective Thank, thanks a lot, Anish. That's uh, useful. So coming to you, Kali, um, so you have seen, uh, you have uh, U-Bank, then you have FE Credit. So how has the consumer behavior changed in the past 12 to, I would say, in the past 12 months um, since the onset of a pandemic? And how do you see this evolving over a period of next, say, 12 to 24 months? Yeah, I mean, uh, from a consumer behavior, I guess, it, both from a salaried professional segment, as well as from a self-employed segment, it has had tremendous impact in a market like uh, Vietnam. Of course, Vietnam has managed the COVID situation much better than most others, if not among the best in the world. Uh, but at the same time, it is not decoupled from the world economy. So it had had its own impact on, on economic factors. So we see, obviously, changes in demand consumerism taking a little bit of a backseat, conservatism coming into the forefront, uh, you know, insurance products being, uh, uptake being, you know, increasingly getting more and more, not only on the health front, but even on uh, life insurance front. Uh, so, and, and of course, digital payments, more and more e-commerce purchases. Like right now, there is a semi-lockdown, a, a social distancing period going on in Vietnam because of a recent spurt in cases spike in, in COVID infections. And you can see the level of, uh, you know, food delivery transactions or even uh, e-commerce transactions for day-to-day -day daily needs, which is something which is very traditional in Vietnam. Vietnam is one of the fastest growing retail markets in the world, but 90% of the, of the retail business is traditional trade. And it's actually growing faster than modern trade. So 
it's very atomized. It's all the neighborhood mom and pop stores, etc. But they are now shifting to e-commerce, you know, uh, online delivery and online uh, ordering and things like that. So the opportunity for us to be embedded in the customer's journey has increased. I think it has accelerated nearly double compared to maybe uh, life as usual before COVID. Uh, so yes, the transformation journey has not changed radically. It has not become completely different. It has on the other hand, accelerated maybe, you know, three, four years of development into a period of nine to 12 months by the customer behavior, which changed dramatically over COVID. Uh, and, and I think at the same time, our way of working, our way of interfacing with the customer, I mean, under normal circumstances, completing an application form for onboarding purely on a chat mode on asking questions and filling up the same application form would have been very different and would have got probably taken much longer. Regulators, regulators might have had a different view if it was before COVID. But I think COVID has changed uh, the situation and we see more and more acceptance of erstwhile unthinkable transactions on, on digital mode being now actually being migrated rapidly onto a digital platform. So I think consumer behavior, our, our own outlook, regulatory outlook, uh, is changing. There are some obviously imperatives of the of the social distancing and other situations. It has accelerated. I won't say that we have seen any radically new uh, tech, other than some back office like work from home and all. Just before we were talk, uh, this call, we were talking about how our 5,000 plus telephone operators are 90% of them are, are moving on to a home uh, operation, work from home, and how technology is having to keep pace with it because we had a auto dialer which was distributing the calls and now we have to do it in a decentralized way in people's home over VPN connections and that's not easy and, and thanks to our technology team we have achieved large part of it obviously not with the same degree of efficiency but uh, so something pretty close to it like like almost 75-80% of those levels of normal BAU levels. So life is clearly not the same after COVID. Perfect. I think that's an interesting uh, perspective. So maybe um, in terms of, uh, I, I'm being mindful of the time that we have while we have many things to ask or discuss. So uh, Samir, coming to you, um, how do you see this entire digital banking evolving, say, by 2025? And what is the preparation, do you think, that as a fintech, as a bank, uh, because ABC is a bank, uh, uh, that a bank should do to embrace that changes? Uh, Samir, you're speaking on mute. I think if I can say I can predict what's going to happen in the coming 18 months, I'd be very smart, right? So I, I wouldn't go really that far. Um, but if I can tell you right now, um, I think there, there is one traditional thing that I always heard uh, from techies, right? From the technology, from any development team, from any technology team, they want to give you the minimum viable product and they want you to sell a standardized product to all your customers, right? Um, what's happening right now is basically revolutionary in the tech uh, space. So to start with, personalization is going to become the norm going forward. So each customer will have his own personalized experience and uh, the transformation and the evolution of the digital bank to address that personalized experience is going to play a critical role in the customer decision on utilizing a, a, a process. And then the second one, which is also important that I always think about is um, everyone, every, there will be an evolution of hundreds of digital banks. Okay? The customer will have the lead in choosing that. So will there be an evolution for a digital bank aggregator? That's a question that comes to my mind. The second part is that which bank will be able to keep the customers engaged and use their experience throughout the time, throughout uh, the life cycle of the customer. So there is a that, that's why there will be always a coexistence of wallets and digital banks because wallet can give you the the the, the, the full super app experience that we we call it the super. Uh, app experience and they have the capacity to do that and the speed to do that while the digital banks will have to uh, comply with the regulations it might be more complicated for them to get into that space so 
wallets will become super apps, digital banks will, will, will tend to get into personalization and the personalization of the customer experience will drive a lot of the behavior, the evolution of aggregators for digital banks will, will, will start coming up where a customer can actually, Anish, you have done something really at the, at the beginning of this where you have multiple banks because you are aggregating services you might want to aggregate some service from multiple banks and give the customer the ability to choose which bank will he go with. And I don't know how the rules and the regulations will work and how banks will, will absorb that, but it's, it's open space. Uh, the, the future is unlimited. Um, I get really uh, surprised uh, when we the speed of movement of everything. And again, don't forget that we've got an Amazon and a Google out there that could become the largest digital bank tomorrow morning if they start, right? Um, so there is a lot of moving parts. Uh, and to predict what's happening uh, in the coming year, I think there will be much, much more digital banks coming up. Regulations will, will become tighter. Um, uh, there will be a reduction in the dependency on traditional uh, retail banks and there will be an expansion from retail into other uh, segments. Um, and finally, uh, customer will continue to decide. Uh, Ride-hailing companies might want to become banks. Uh, uh, everyone might want to become a bank at the end of the day because there is a yield equation here that the banks makes that nobody else makes. And everyone is fighting to expand into the other part like in the acceptance space where, where, or in the acquiring space, you see uh, online businesses starting going offline or, or starting going with, to physical stores and vice versa, all right? Here, it's actually the evolution of digital banks. There is no digital bank that's going physical, uh, but I think we will start with many, many digital banks. There will be aggregation, then they will start moving again to physical, and this is... This is how I think it, it, it will be. I'm not sure. No one can say what will happen tomorrow, right? And thanks a lot, Samir. I think that was an interesting point in terms of the aggregator of the digital, so-called the neo banking platform. So Anish, over to you. What's your quick thoughts about it before we open it for a Q&A? Right. Uh, so uh, first thing, like completely agree with Samir and this embedded finance as a terminology and everybody will now want it to become a bank. And uh, for example, in open, we have a separate business unit called Switch, where we are already powering one of the largest FMCG to create their own, uh, this thing, one of the large e-commerce companies to create their own digital banks, basically on our APIs infrastructure. But uh, what the future is going to be, uh, we will see now more digital banks coming. It, it not need not necessarily be from fintechs. It could be non-fintechs. And that also means it's a larger opportunity for the banks, the intermediaries who are actually like, you know, providing this uh, infrastructure as well. And, uh, you know, that's what, uh, you know, uh, that's what, you know, I feel like, you know, what's going to happen. And definitely we are, we are in an exciting phase. Basically, we can't fully predict like where it is going on, but a lot of, you know, a uh, lot of excitement that is happening for everyone, all of us in this space. Perfect. Thank, thanks a lot, Anish. So, Ravish, before I open up for the q and I could see a, uh, quite a number of questions. Um, from an innocent perspective, from the bank's perspective, uh, what are the preparations that you've been doing to um, go and uh, compete? So I think Samir talked about hyper-personalization. And today, as a consumer, we have seen our experience when we uh, interact with many, any of these consumer internet companies like the banks of the world. So, and if I look at more and more comp the uh, so-called the new banks platforms or these, um, they are trying to emulate something what some of these large consumer internet companies has done in terms of uh, personalization. So how do you see uh, the bank, especially in terms of a innocent bank, taking up that particular uh, uh, challenge and then evolving or improving the so-called uh, the customer experience? Yeah. So I think, uh, see that the pillars that we are using is to actually get to a certain place, right? And I've discussed the pillars, but I'll just maybe synthesize those, right? I think that out of all of them, uh, to your point specifically, I think three of them are, are essentially extremely relevant. Is how do you, how do you, you know, ensure that, uh, you know, that there's a, you know, line that I read on social media and I find it very relevant. Let me just bring that up. Uh, so growth is actually, true growth is, is, true customer engagement and the loyalty that you develop. 
uh, acquisition actually, uh, which people call it as growth, is actually child's play, right? So the idea is that if you are able to, you know, uh, engage your customers that you have acquired, that is the true growth, right? At the end of the day, uh, so that that at least resonates uh, with me, and at least as a bank, I think these are the three, uh, you know, things that will help us to grow, right? And in, when I say grow, it's not just about acquisition. but about uh, you know engagement and loyalty right because that is what is going to differentiate us uh, from the other banks uh, in the future right uh, and those pillars are going to be uh, to some is point i completely bang on right personalization how do you set your you know the, the entire data uh, structures at the back end to offer that personalization to the customers uh, number 2 is uh, you know experience layer how do you provide those experiences to the customer uh, in the matter which is relevant to them right they would want to see what what matters to them rather than something that is completely you know open for uh, you know everyone else so uh, providing the right kind of experiences to the customer through the customer journey so differentiate how how well can you differentiate that and number 3 is the the middle uh, the at least the middle and the back end right the api led connectivity so how can you try and deliver these experiences because all these experience apis process apis will be will be at the back end right so using the triad right this particular triad we can actually achieve the true growth uh, which i see as like actual customer engagement uh, if you ask me and so thank thanks a lot ravish for this uh, points so maybe moving on to the questions i think there are quite a number of questions that we have it from our uh, audience so maybe the first question is directly to you anish uh, someone is trying to ask uh, It, how easy was it for doing a partnership with the different banks was it really a easy or it was a difficult task and moreover what were the concerns from a bank with regards to security and compliance i think that's one of the points that we didn't touch upon it but would like to hear it from you right so vivek um, the first bank which we have partnered with uh, four years back when we started has it is still on the uat stage we are not still going live with that particular bank uh but uh, just to uh, you know uh, it was a really tough uh, this thing because unlike a payment service provider or payment gateway where the apis were standardized and available here from a bank's perspective there is a lot more risk when you're dealing with um, you know fintech or so called you know a neo banking platform because uh, you know in terms of the security the if something goes wrong with the customer funds like you know the bank's reputation the license everything is in stake uh, while most of the times the business business sets always gives the approval it, it always gets stuck when it comes to the compliance and the legal but one good thing which we have done and this is advice which i also always give for fellow entrepreneurs is that you know plan for those uh, you know the information security the iso uh, you know the in 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 case of an india getting a certain audit uh, uh, you know uh, uh, audit basically uh, the pcids has complained if it is required uh, take that as a priority build that as a department right from the beginning in, and also very important part is like you know the how do you manage the fraud the risk mitigation as well because the more and more now the banks are also uh, if you have this in place it's easier to actually reduce the go to market especially when you have to deal with the banking partner for us a lot of things were actually by through learning it took a lot of time for us to actually get it right but now after like the first two or three banks now it's becomes more easier because we have the process in place we have the certifications in place uh, and things like that uh, having said that uh, there are like that's also the reason why like you know the intermediaries now there are like a lot of third party providers who actually done this for you so this could be help you go to, go, go to market faster than actually going directly dealing with a bank which they probably take around 11 to 12 months and that's thanks thanks a lot anish uh, so quickly i think there is a question from vibha and i really would like to uh, reach out to kali and um, samir there is a question which talks about uh, in comparison to a wallet how does the bank perceive banking mobile real estate so maybe uh, she's trying to ask how is wallet different from the uh, uh, the digital banking and i know in vietnam you have seen the surge of wallet at one point of time and Uh, Samir, I know that um, you have been running the wallet as well as the digital bank. So maybe over to you, uh, Kali. Then I'll uh, quickly uh, go back to Samir for his thoughts, especially in terms of wallet versus digital bank. Well, I think uh, wallets are uh, purely uh, payment driven, and I, I think the augmented services in terms of having credit line attached to them, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, wealth management options, or in terms of a larger ecosystem play. has always been thought through but there are restrictions which kind of limit the capability of a wallet against a full service digital bank in fact prepaid accounts from digital banks or even main street banks uh, sometimes can be actually bit more powerful bit more feature rich compared to wallets per se 
Uh, and wallets in, in Vietnam, for example, uh, a wallet which we have a strategic partnership with called SmartPay is focusing more on uh, the same atomized retail that I talked about and signing up micro merchants to facilitate the general population of customer to use it for their daily life in the points of sale that they go to. So the focus has shifted a little bit from customers where they are doing B2B tie-ups, B2B2C type of tie-ups uh, through anonymized scan to pay uh, options, SDKs embedded in the bank's uh, mobile banking, but enabling the bank's customers to make payments at the retail merchants that they are tying up because the banks are not serving those retail, retail merchants and they're not targeting them as acceptance points either and neither are the big associations uh, or the scheme cards. So the wallet is payment focused where the bank is, is able to encompass a larger uh, area of services. So if you look at retail financial services, you have the transaction products, right? The debit cards and the CASA accounts, you have the savings products, the, the, the short-term saving product, you have the entire gamut of loans, secure, secured, unsecured, term overdraft, you have investment, and then you have protection, your insurance. A bank is able to complete the uh, the, the full service, all the baskets in which products can be categorized, whereas wallets are primarily in the transaction area. So banks definitely have a wider spectrum to cover compared to wallets. Okay, thank, thanks a lot, Kali. So over to you, Samir. Uh, you spoke about super apps. You spoke about uh, you already. Uh, uh, your team is already running up a successful or maybe arguably the best uh, wallet in the uh, region. So how do you compare wallets to the digital banks? Um, I think Kalida summarized it really uh, well. Uh, I think uh, wallets are to do with payments, but I would just like to add to it uh, the untapped segments or the segments that the banks are not really interested in. And this is where we went to the blue collars, I think, uh, where we'll go to other segments that banks really don't, don't really look at. But um, it's a way to empower uh, transactions and make sure that transactions take place and drive more transactions and help in accelerating uh, uh, cash conversion now. The reason you want to expand that wallet into a super app because you want more engagement and more transactions, really. So uh, any payments company and uh, any fintech uh, today is looking at the transactions. Transactions is all what we look at. So in my business, for example, uh, wallet is quite important and strategic as well because if you look at other financial services today, we serve banks and financial institutions where we provide them back office operations, technology, and we help them operate. They own their marketing and decide on their customers and the rest of it, we do it for them. And then we've got a merchant community, which uh, basically are a direct acquirer in multiple markets. And then we have the FinTech arm where actually we're using that arm to be our uh, product development arm. So we partner with FinTechs that adds value to our uh, two core businesses here. So a wallet cuts across to deliver uh, uh, services to both my merchants and to my financial institutions and potentially on incorporate the fintechs into that wallet becomes really more critical to businesses like ours. Uh, and then uh, don't forget, uh, all of us, all the digital will have the power of that. Uh, banks being banks or being uh, wallets. Um, banks in specific have a wider range. I think uh, where, where banks uh, are going to evolve even further, I think uh, is it, they're going to go into different segments because at this point of time, you see banks that are doing retail, very small number that are doing SMEs, but I think they will evolve even to a wider uh, segments and, and, and their product offering will be much more in terms of financial instruments. And thanks a lot, Samir. I think uh, so. We have quite a number of still questions coming in. Maybe uh, what we will do it to our, for our audience. Maybe we'll uh, reach out to you individually for those questions. And if you can find some time to respond to those, we will be happy to share it on our uh, handle. So that's something uh, that we would like to do because there are quite a number of questions that have come up from the uh, various uh, audience over here. So I think uh, I've already we have already exceeded a time by ten minutes. Uh, but uh, just would like to summarize, I think it was really a, a great having you all on the panel today. I think it was a very, very interesting perspective brought in forward by Anish, Kalidas, uh, Samir, and as well as uh, from your side, Ravish, in terms of how the digital banks are shaping up and how 
essentially what are the digital transformation or so called the technology best practices that some of these digital banks or the banks are following to go and compete um, with the same set of customers and trying to offer them the superior customer experience or so called as samir was saying the hyper personalized experience so i think it was great having you all over here as part of our today's panel we wanted to do uh, uh, more discussion but unfortunately we have a limited time so thanks once again for joining in and stay tuned for our episode 3 till that point of time i would say stay safe and stay mask and kali once again apologize for the slightly um, miscommunication on the title uh, maybe my team loaded in incorrectly so thank thanks once again for joining in no problem thank you and thanks to my fellow panelists it was a pleasure it was really a Same pleasure here. all over here thanks thank once again bye thank you everyone bye, bye.